ignition. Lift off. Welcome to the GHT Overland Podcast, where we visit with overland travelers and explorers around the globe, learning from their experiences and enjoying their stories. We are Chris and Lisa. However, today it's just me. We are from a little city called Washougal in Washington State, known as the entrance to the Columbia River Gorge. Today's featured guests are Jack and Christina from JK Overland. Jack and Christina are fairly new to overlanding, so we are very excited to hear about their early adventures and what they have learned in preparing for their trips. So, without further ado, welcome, guys. Hello. Hey, hello. (laughs) Good to be on. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. It's our pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. So fill us in on any blanks on that intro and give us a little glimpse into your backgrounds. Right. So, well, we both live in England. Um, I'm originally from Latvia. Um, I moved to England in 2009. And I suppose I fall in love with Jack. (laughs) And that completely swung me on a completely different path. And we start our trips overlanding. And uh, yeah, well, well I am. Um, I'm born and bred in the UK. Um, live in a little town called Brighton. Well, it's a city now. It used to be a town. It's now a city on the south coast, southeast, just below London. And um, yeah, we've uh, we've sort of fallen into this this overlanding thing in the last two or three years. And it's uh, so far, it's been a really exciting journey. Yeah, I suppose we all started with little camping trips and then we kind of started taking a bit further and further um, by getting our four, four, first 4x4 four four vehicle and and we started doing a bit of roading and then overlanding and then thinking, oh, okay, let's just try to explore a bit more world and see where it takes us. <laughs> so here we are at the moment in Portugal and we don't know where we're going to go next. So currently, we're talking to you. You're in Portugal, is that right? We are. Yep. <laughs> Very Guilty. good. And you're kind of in a <laughs> nice. You're kind of in the middle of a trip, as I understand. So, like, give us an idea. What time is it there? It is four p.m. at the moment. So, what time is it over there where you are? Yeah. So it's just after eight o'clock in the morning. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, funnily enough, it's uh, we're on the same time as the UK here, so it's um, okay. Like, like being at home time-wise. Yeah, it's a bit strange, but yes, we are on a trip at the moment. We currently on two months trip. We are almost halfway. Yeah, we left just before New Year's, so we had we arrived just in time to spend New Year's in Galicia, in northern Spain. So we spent some time up there in the north, and uh, we slowly worked our way south, mainly along the coast. Mainly, yes. And now we're about, we're about halfway down the west coast of Portugal. Yeah, so the destination probably will be our goal, yeah. Now, as we learned in your intro, you guys are somewhat new to overlanding. Are you doing this full-time now, or it sounds like maybe just a few months at a time? I think the end goal clearly for both of us now is to be able to do this full time Uh, at the moment it is part time we both have jobs back home or we're self-employed and um, we have been you know saving up in between trips and uh, basically saving for the trips and uh, that's uh, we come back and then we have to work again and and then plan the next trip. Yeah. Although, to be honest, normally we are planning the next trip whilst we're already on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens. <laughs> it does always happen. Um, and, yeah, so things are already being spoken about where to next, and it's a very, very exciting, all this. Oh, well, we always, when we are on the trip, we we'll always make a list of things, next modifications yeah. and add-ons, because when, once you're doing it, there's always something goes wrong. It's never going to be everything perfect, or you have these inspirations. Oh, shall we do this? Or shall we do that? Always to make something your life, to improve. There's always something to improve <laughs> to make yeah. your life easier. Yeah. That's for sure. 
Okay, good. And when did you first start overlanding? I think you touched on it a little bit, but like how long have you, when did that first camping trip spur this whole thing? Well, camping really, we started four years ago, we started really the camping, yeah. but the actual overlanding, I think that was two, three years. Camping trips and long weekends and things taken in the vehicle, you know, you take all the gear and we go off to places such as Wales and um, we got to, we to Scotland, Cumbria, Cumbria, Northumberland, Cambridge. even Scotland. And we would just love being out, out there in nature and mm. we would always choose, you know, the quietest, remotest sort of camp spots we could find and yeah. really enjoy spending time outside yeah, in, the, in nature. I think and, the, uh, the wilderness is, is definitely calling and... Yeah, that is our main calling, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I mean, well, um, well, I grew up, um, I would say, on the farm, so my background goes where I would have farm animals and, you know, growing crops and just easy, chilled life, not city life. Um, yeah, we both, <laughs> both grew up in the countryside but ended up in the city. I don't know how that so, happened. Yeah, no idea. So I think that explains why we try to we, escape as much as possible. Yeah, no, we we also fell in love with this this method of travel. You know, this self sufficient vehicle and where it can take you and how easy it can take you there, and it's just yeah. just fantastic. Yeah, I think it has been a massive step up for okay. us. Okay. Yeah, great. So, tell us about your current vehicle and if you travel i don't think you do but uh, clarify if you do do you travel with any other like uh trailer or motorcycle in tow no we have uh we just have the vehicle which is a 1996 mitsubishi shogun uh it's a 2.8 turbo diesel just like a, a station wagon style um I don't know if you have, I think you do have them in the US, but maybe they're named slightly different, differently. They're named differently everywhere. You get it could be the Pajero or it could be Montero. Um, there's many different names. Mm. And this, this vehicle we've had for it's a, just over a year, actually. Well, it would have been, will be two years in, in August. Yep. So, and this is probably the most. Reliable, I would say. Reliable and, and most kitted out vehicle we've done so far. And we've just we've just taken on a, a big project before we came out here to convert it into a into a camper <laughs> or a micro camper, you might call it. <laughs> cool. Yes, yeah, so there was a bit of a pressure, I would say. Jack, um, literally about a month before or ferry, um, he came up with this idea of shall we convert or. Don, we call our car Don, he has a name, uh, shall we convert it into a camper? And I thought, really? Okay, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> and we had a friend um, who's a carpenter and he helped us to, he gave us a hand, so he helped us to do this conversion. And, and that made happened. all the difference, didn't it? Yeah, um, it did. So I can't imagine anyway. Yeah, it's, it's basically, we've built, so as um down one side, you have the kitchen with um, like a sink and a two-burner two burner. hob that runs on a on a camping gas, a small camping gas bottle, which has on its own storage underneath. And there's cupboards below that where we store food pieces and other things. Water. And, yep, the water. water and it has fr- there's a fresh water tank which goes to the tap, and there's a wastewater one which comes from the sink. There's also a fridge just next to that, and then it's separated by a walkway in the middle. And you have a like a slide out bed. It's, it's, it's a couch, and then it, it slides out into a into, into a, a small bed, double yeah. bed, which is enough. Yeah, yeah it's all co- cozy and comfortable, and does the job. So. We have more plans already. And is that your first overland vehicle, or did you start with something different? Uh, we've had a, a few vehicles when we, back when we were talking a minute ago, about four years ago. We started with a, you'll know this one, um, a Jeep Cherokee XJ. They are boxy, boxy Jeep Cherokee, which we loved. And it was so sad to let that one go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
that got us into we did a bit of off-roading in, in that and yes that's where it all started in that in that exactly. car exactly I think because it was off-roading, I thought, oh, well, you know, it's quite exciting. Let's go off-roading. And then, oh, camping is fun. Actually, I really like doing that. Oh, what about overlanding? I'm thinking. Yeah, the I'm combination not... created our yeah. interest in overlanding. Yes, and then we just did, did more trips and weekend trips, then took a week at the time, two weeks, then a month. And... and following that, we had an Isuzu Trooper. Oh, yes. We had that for a couple of years, which that... That was probably where we started doing bigger trips, and you would call overlanding. We went down to the Pyrenees. Yep. So that was uh, the mountain range between Andorra, France, France, Andorra, and Spain. And Spain, correct, yeah. That was a fantastic trip. It was coast to coast from one side, starting in France, all the way across and ending in the the Atlantic coast, all the way across to the Mediterranean Sea. Mm. on the Spanish side. That's amazing. There's quite a lot of off-road routes as well. There's this amazing route called Smuggler's Route. Uh, it, that was entering into Andorra. And it's amazing. So obviously there's history back there. So obviously smugglers used to use that route. Never going to forget that. It's amazing. Yeah, sounds good. What is that one thing you value the most, either on or in your vehicle that you have learned over these different trips that you just would not take a trip without? <laughs> okay. Well, for me, I think for, oh, for both of us, that's a bit um, uh, sentimental value, but that is our café or or coffee. Um, Definitely. <laughs> it's like a little um, cafeteria, so it's an espresso mini machine. Um, and we wouldn't go without our morning coffee at all. <laughs> we wouldn't get very far. <laughs> no, we wouldn't get very far. Go wake up. And that's like a, an espresso machine? Tell me about that. It's, it's just a, do you know, like a, a cafe tea, like an Italian style. You put it onto a, a hob or a gas burner, and okay. it heats the hot water in in the base, which then forces it through uh, a little section which has the ground coffee in. Yeah, and then it comes up a, a spout in the middle and, and comes over the top and fills the the finished the product basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we wouldn't. Yeah, we really love that. Um, we'll be upset. That's if fantastic. We forget that. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's I, number one. <laughs> I, I believe you were expecting some gear, gear answer. <laughs> no, I like the different uh, the different <laughs> answers. So that's that's fantastic because I'm a coffee person too, and I can totally relate to that. If I didn't have that coffee in the morning, just like Jack said, we we wouldn't get very far. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's a necessity. Well, we, we do love tea, but coffee is something. Uh, yeah, being from England, yeah. we, we do like a good cup of tea as well. Yeah, I have to learn <laughs> to like tea as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So anything you guys originally packed with you on some of those first trips that you found that were just totally not necessary and you no longer take with you? That's the tricky one because um, because it's been a, a sort of gradual process building up to these trips bigger and bigger. I think it, we've kind of got used to quite quickly what we need and what we didn't need from those earlier, you know, weekend camping trips and things. I think we've been reducing the amount we've of stuff d- yeah, over. Definitely reduced. Mm, um, I, I would say we're quite light packers. <laughs> we, we um, as I said, we have everything we need within this fairly small vehicle, either inside or on the roof rack, and that's the. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, and it works very well. We've been we've been thinking about it. We thought, is there anything we don't need, or is there anything we have forgotten? Um, we used to seems very good. We used to have a few extra things. So we used to have um, a, a Kelly kettle, which is oh yes, yeah. fantastic. It's basically you um, so it burns on burns on either dry twigs or pine cones, and it and it boils the the kettle that sits above above that base which is fantastic but you need, when you've got to really look after what space you have then um sometimes you have to I su- yeah. kick a few things out <laughs> yeah, i suppose that's one of the things we kicked out and the barbecue and the barbie 
Um, but whether we will take those again in the future, I don't know. Well, we replaced Barbie with all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Which we use as a seat, actually. So yeah. uh, it's only Jack who can sit there. <laughs> we bought a, like a log burning uh, a camping stove. We've used it once so far on this trip, and we've been here a month. But um, we hope to use it some more. Yeah. And what was it you replaced with uh, the Barbie? With, um, well, I would say we replaced Barbie with the log burner. So you can, yeah, you can, cook, you can cook over it um, in a pan. It's like just, a little yeah. portable log burner, yeah. So you can cook on it. And So tell us a little bit more about your kitchen. What does your average meal setup consist of or look like? Um, well, we pretty much eat, um, or I cook the same meals that we have back at home. So it hasn't really... Um, affected, let's say, or diet being here on a trip because you have everything you need. You've got sink and hob. But the meals would be the same, um, like vegetables, like rice or pasta. We make like risottos. And... That's a good one, though. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's yeah, one of Jack, my favourites. That's Jack's favourite. And Jack's very good at um, cooking some Italian or Mexican meals like um, spaghetti bolognese or... Enchiladas, fajitas. Yeah, yeah, I love all that kind of cooking. Yeah, keep it quite quite simple, but still, um, yeah, they would cook no some... sacrifices really. Yeah, so cook up some veg and some grains on the side, and and we also have a forty liter uh, Waco fridge freezer, so that keeps everything nice and fresh and cool. So we shop every three, four days, I would say, for fresh yeah. food vegetables obviously we could do it once a week but we do like more more food we like to have fresh (laughs) fresh food fresh bread yeah exactly fresh fruit okay so like you stop at like a local uh shopping mart or something when you're close by and uh kind of stock up on some of those uh, necessities yeah so like local bakeries or markets if if we can find some Quite often it's a, a big supermarket because they're everywhere in Europe and I'm sure okay. everywhere else. Yeah. But we will also stop at the local bakeries and things to to pick up some fresh fresh things or yeah. even the markets now and then. Yeah. But mostly through supermarkets. Indeed. Yep. What's a favorite recipe you guys like to cook on the road? Think, well, chicken and chorizo result. <laughs> that's Jack's definitely, <laughs> yes, that's his favorite. But Christina cooks that one, yeah. Chicken chorizo result. I would say that would go be, through the recipe. That, that would be your winner. Um, well, the recipe would be like um, chop, tin of chopped tomatoes, or you usually stock up on those uh, red peppers, yellow peppers, uh, risotto rice, chicken stock, chorizo, obviously chicken. And um, what else? I think that's about it. So if you fancy some spinach, you can whack that in as well. So, yeah. It is delicious. Yeah. It's quite a quite easy meal to make. And for me, fajitas. Okay, awesome. Well, I've been sort of trying to stick to one pot, not too overcomplicated, because obviously it's a small small space as well and um, you don't want loads of washing up at the end <laughs> or steam up the whole room like the other day I cooked um, onions and Jack was crying <laughs> yep <laughs> he was <Whoops>. screaming <laughs> <laughs> he was screaming indeed so I ended up with all the windows open and <laughs> so I have to be sort of mindful of what you're cooking well, and that's kind of important, right? You don't want something too complicated. You want something delicious, but quick and easy to do. Yeah. So how do you guys are, how are you managing laundry on the road? Do you have something set up or do you stop at laundry mats? What's your preferred method? I would like it to be set up. We're thinking about it, but so far we've been stopping at laundry mats. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, across, well, definitely in Spain and Portugal, we found they have these um i don't know what you call them but it's like a laundromat but it's it's outside and it's in a like a supermarket car park where they have um it's like it's all done by machine and you just insert the coins and select your function there's a washer dryer 
and it's really easy and fairly cheap and that's worked really well for us okay mm. Great. And hygiene, how are you? Um, I can go maybe a few days without taking a shower. How are you guys managing that on the road? <laughs> yeah, that is something to <laughs> that we have to think about. Well, we're the same. You know, I can go a few days without a shower. We don't need to shower every day. Um, no. So every now and then we stop at the campsites and we try to look out for some local campsites like um, government-based which are very cheap and cheerful, and it has more than enough what we need. Uh, hot showers, that's it. That ticks all yeah, the in, boxes. In some countries in Europe, they have like um, council-run campsites, which are normally nice, nice and clean, and and uh, they have they have all the facilities you could need. So we'll stop there maybe in four or five days at the max. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or I realise there's restriction on days. If it's... Um, but- a warmer time of the year it's winter here as it is where you are now and um so we need to do that but otherwise in the summer we would if there's a nice river or lake uh, sometimes mm, yeah. that suffices and we're happy to do that so okay yeah that's always nice in the summer not so nice in the winter no no i don't, <laughs> don't fancy jumping in a river well, now <laughs> we had a dip in thermal pools Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. On um, a Spanish on Portuguese border, there is this currently geothermal line, and we had a couple of days in thermal pools, and that was very lovely. <laughs> yeah, it was hotter than the bath was, you'd have at home. Exactly. Outside temperature was four degrees, so that's Celsius, and yeah, and the water temperature. I have no idea. But it was too hot because once we got out, we felt a bit dizzy. So I thought, wow. <laughs> A beautiful location up yeah. in the mountains. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. Okay. Even though the weather was bad. Yeah, it was raining. It was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and we were in a hot bath <laughs> up in the mountains. Yeah, that must have been nice. Yeah, it, you know, that's all the experiences you sort of collect, you know, along your journey. And all adds up. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So with those experiences, tell us about um, your current top two or three destinations along with a little detail and why you enjoyed them so much okay um firstly i'd have to say wales which is really close to home for us yeah um where we started all all this doing the, the camping trips and and more and more trips slightly longer each time and uh, we just love it up there because it's so wild and rugged. You've got the mountains, you've got the coastline, and it's Gosh. all, yeah, and it's yeah. just um, it's stunning. Landscapes, very open, and um, you find beautiful places to camp. It's beautiful at any time of the year. So yeah. Like winter. Yeah, you go to winter, it'll be snowing. Or, uh, it never gets that hot there, does it? But no, <laughs> no. You, you, don't, you don't mind because it's so... It's, uh, as they say, it's always raining in Wales, but oh, Wales is not for sissies. So. <laughs> and there's um, <laughs> but it's beautiful. Amazing off-road tracks oh, um, God. Yeah. which you can do all over the place. I love it. Some of the tracks will just take you to such amazing destinations. And, you know, it's good. You have a vehicle which gives you the option to do it. So otherwise, in a regular car, you wouldn't really go too far secondly would I would say what would we say Pyrenees Pyrenees yep Pyrenees oh, we, yeah. we loved that trip it was only a two week trip that time but um, you know, I was saying before it's coast to coast from the Atlantic coast to the Mediterranean coast on the other side through France Spain and Andorra yeah uh, it's just oh it's just amazing spectacular I mean, also the scenery kept changing. I remember, um, I like, well, both of us were um, doing photography and my camera just didn't leave my lap at all. Um, the mountains, stunning. They keep changing. So you have these um, views covered in fields of lavender and then you drive through um, what, like uh, where they grow wine, like grapes. And the vines, yeah. The vines, and then you go into the very, very wild parts of very rugged and rivers and streams. And um, it seems like it's almost 
hard to take all in at once because the scenery is just kept changing all the time. It's beautiful, really beautiful. But our favourite so far has to be Portugal. Yeah. yeah. I really love, well, also I do, because the Europe, but that's sort of Spain. Yeah, but, you did say three. Yeah, <laughs> I did say three. It was quite tricky because there's so many, though. <laughs> okay, well, let's say the third one it would be Portugal. Portugal. Because we're here, yeah. the second time we're here. Portugal is so welcoming, so friendly, and so open. Um, and it's just... We've been here last year for two weeks, and yeah, it we've... was a very fast-paced trip. Um, we saw ourselves up for a challenge to just drive through very quickly but now we're here for we had to come back didn't we yeah and now we're, we're doing it all over again but much much slower so slow we can paced take things in in more detail yeah so is it the beauty of the nature that you're in combined with the people that you've met along the road that make that so uh so special right there oh chris i mean definitely people here um I have never experienced um, so much kindness and love from, you know, absolute complete strangers. On um, like just just simple gestures. Um, for example, we, people give us kiwis, homemade jams, homemade ciders. So many gifts. And so many gifts. Not that it's not about the gift, but it's just how and people are happy that you're here and they. I sort of have this thing of giving you something, and I just love that. It feels, I don't know, strangely it feels home. Um, you feel, you don't feel like you're alien or something like that. And, it's nice. and yes, the scenery. And the scenery, of course. Coming from the north, where it's all rugged mountains and forests, and you, you're coming down to the coastline and it becomes, you know, like a arid, yeah. uh, deserty and... Yeah. You know, sand dunes and oh, sand dunes, they're yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and then there's amazing cliff formations on the coast. Mm. And like, there's a place called Cathedral Cove. Beach or Cathedral, Cathedral. Cathedral Beach, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, Cathedral Beach. Yeah, or Cove, um, there's these amazing uh, arches and formations in the, in the rock there, which yeah. you can only see for an hour at low tide, but it's just you have if to you stay see. there for too long, they will your shoes will get soaked like ours. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean Portugal has a bit of everything. You see, you know, you got like a little corner of paradise there, and just love it here. Although it is very sad for us to see that they had massive fires last year, and some of the places we've been visiting, even the place where we're staying now, we've been here last year. And the trees, they all are burned, and some of them seem to me they will be cut down, and they haven't seen. Oh, it's very, that. very badly burned. Very sad to see that. So, masses, and masses of forests, obviously, are gone. Gotcha. Well, it sounds like a great place. We'll have to put that on the the list of of places to go visit. Oh, if you go to Europe, yeah. definitely. Let's uh, let's move from that to what a big challenge would be. And what I want you to do is really dig deep and tell us about a challenge, a time where you just didn't know how you were going to get out of that situation and how it was that you resolved um, the the predicament that you were in. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I think that was my fault. <laughs> um What a fun couple, full of information and experience, proving you don't need to be retired or have a lifetime of savings to take overland trips, build an overland truck, and get out and do it. Now, this episode of the GHT Overland Podcast with Jack and Christina is our longer format interview, so we split these into two episodes for your downloading pleasure. Don't worry. New episodes are released each Thursday. In the next episode, Christina finishes her story of their biggest challenge, overlanding, and how to avoid the same mistakes she made. Information you're going to want to learn from. Oh, and quite a story of four drunk Portugal surfers 
the GHT Overland podcast, and Jack and Christina's car being hit. Oh boy. Be sure to visit Jack and Christina at JK Overland on the web and social media, including their YouTube channel. It's a good idea to visit the show notes page on our website at ghtoverland.com. Click on podcast, then select the JK Overland episode. All the details and links in this episode are there for you. Now, before we race off, it would mean the world to us, and I mean the entire globe, if you'd subscribe, rate, and review each episode. Give GHT Overland some love so we can reach as many Overlanders as possible. Passing on priceless experience, knowledge, and stories of Overlanders doing good in the world. Thank you, and we will see you next Thursday over on Part 2. What are you waiting for? Go give us some podcast love with a subscribe, rate, and review. Bye. Thank you.